that you should have gotten, you know? So I'm going to bring him on right now. Thank you. Uh, people of Smith Chapel, Mr. Imhotep. How y'all doing? All right, all right. So what would you all think about uh, part two of um, the African Americans Many Rivers Across? How many people have seen that before? Okay. What you, would you all think about that? It's very informative. Very informative? Okay. Who was? Yes. You know, something that was, uh, um, I just want to point out, that particular bridge mm -hmm. that was shown coming from Covington mm -hmm. to uh, Cincinnati. Right. I walked across that bridge. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Going from Kentucky to from, Ohio? From Covington into yep. Ohio. Okay. Yes. Uh, you know, I was for a morning walk. Right. And uh, I was at a jazz festival. Okay. And I was just taking a morning walk, and I said, you know, it was amazing just to walk across the bridge because you walked across the river. Right. But I took that stroll, and I had to, of course, stroll back. Right. But, yeah, that's the bridge that I walked across. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Anybody? Uh, yes. <laughs> my, my family has gone to Georgia okay. every year since I was born. Okay, you all own land down there? Not really. Okay. My grandparents were there. My father came here for us to work. Okay. And once he got a car every summer, that's where we went every summer. What, what year did he come here? Uh, 40, probably around 46. Okay, so that's right after World War II ends, and doing a, that's still during the Great Migration, uh, which was from 1915 to 1970, basically. So eventually, you know, after 75 was built, we stopped going 24. Okay, the right. Um, my point is, I'll never cross that bridge again feeling the same way. Right. Because I didn't have this information all those years. Right. So when I cross there, from now on, this film will come to mind. Absolutely. And then I saw a hand right next to you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I have family members in Natchez, and I know that little area. Natchez, Mississippi? Yeah, Natchez, Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. And I've been going to Natchez. I go to Mississippi sometimes two or three times a year. Right. Not necessarily at the Natchez, Columbia, Hattiesburg, New Orleans, all in that area. I have family members. Now, Nam person told me that little place in Natchez is like the the main place for the slaves. For slaves sold. Right, right. And they might have not even known that. They live right there in Natchez. Well, 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 Mississippi is also the state that had the most number of lynchings right. from 1882 exactly. to 1968. Right. There are 581 lynchings. Out of, of 4,743 lynchings yeah. from 1882 to 1968, 581 took place in Mississippi. Yeah. So, so in November 2018, when you had the public hanging woman, Cindy Hyde Smith, Who's the senator there joking about public lynchings, yeah. a public hanging? Mm -hmm. There's a deep history okay. of that of that I in Mississippi. Saw, yes, we saw the beginning of a lynching as a small child. Right. When they literally took a young tenant off my uncle's property because mm -hmm. he literally they thought he was with a white woman and they literally drug him out of. But that was small, not small. I was like 11 years old and saw them pull him out. Right. Of his of his shack. Right. The lynching. Absolutely. Are, are we to, to believe that mm -hmm. public lynchings were a public record as though people may be sentenced to uh, incarceration today? You say no. that, that was... Yeah, well, well, a lot of that comes from the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson and okay. his group, who, who, who were able to uncover okay. a lot of lynchings uh -huh. that took place. And, and um, in uh, Alabama, they have the... Uh, they have the, it's like a lynching memorial, and there's a museum also. That just opened last year. But Brian Stevenson, who's an attorney, he's done a lot of research, the Equal Justice Initiative. They've done a lot of research dealing with uh, uh, lynchings in this country. So if you go to the NAACP's website, NAACP.org, they have a page there dealing with the history of lynchings in this country. And they deal with, they document uh, 4,743 between 1882 to 1968. And they break down which states they took place in. Mississippi has, has, has the most number, 581. Okay, uh, I think I saw one other hand. Did I see another hand? The, yes, sister. The 4,000 number that yeah. you just gave up, that's just based on what they know, but they recognize there are many more that are undocumented. Yeah, that's, ba that's based upon what they've been able to, like, really... Uh, document to some extent. But that's from 1882 to 1968. The Civil War ends in 1865, June 2nd, 1865. So there, so you have white domestic terrorism taking place 
after the Civil War ends, because December 24th, 1865, in Pelosi, Tennessee, that's when the Ku Klux Klan is founded. Okay? And, and, and the Klan is not just killing African Americans, they're killing white Republicans and they're killing Jews also. Okay? So, um, but they're just leaving after 1882 uh, up to 1968. All right, so um, I, I've seen all six uh, episodes. I also have a book that Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. put out that's a companion to this as well. Okay? So you may want to you may want to get the book. Um, how many here were here? What was it? What, what day would do part one? Was that Monday or Tuesday? It was Tuesday. Tuesday. Who, who was here Tuesday? We were at the other another church. Is anybody here? Okay, one person. All right, good, good. All right, so I'm Michael M. Hotel. I'm the founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show, a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. And uh, once again, this is February. It's African American History Month. Now today is February 8th. So this is an important date in history. Number one, February 8th, 1925, is when uh, Marcus Garvey went to prison in, in Atlanta. Okay? Uh, so th this is the anniversary of that because he was, uh, he was uh, convicted in 1923 and, in there, and there were appeals and he went to prison February 8th, 1925. Then also February 8th, 1915 is the day the movie The Birth of a Nation debuted. And if you understand the history of the movie The Birth of a Nation, that rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. Because yes. yes. 1915... Well, so a lot, a lot took place in 1915, so this is basically at the beginning of the Great Migration, and this is the uh, second year of World War II, which was 1914 to 1918. Uh, also in 1915, Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, co-founds the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915 in Chicago, okay? And uh, 1915 is the 50th year anniversary of the Civil War ending and the 13th Amendment, which legally freed enslaved Africans. Right? It was an Emancipation Proclamation. January 1st, 1863. Who's actually read the Emancipation Proclamation? Anybody actually read it? Okay, go to loc.gov, Library of Congress website. loc.gov, even through the government shutdowns, the website is still up, you can still read it, all right? And uh, you read it, and it gives you all these exceptions. It tells you basically the slaves in the states of rebellion in the Confederacy, they're free, but the slaves in the border states like Maryland and different things like this, Kentucky, the, the slaves in the border states, they're still, they're, they're still slaves. Then also the, the uh, territories that the Union brought back, took from the Confederacy and brought back into the Union, had control of those slaves in those territories. They were still slaves also. So it was a military strategy that's going to lead to the Civil War ending and it's going to lead to the 13th Amendment, uh, which is ratified December 6, 1865 and adopted December 18, 1865. But, but the Emancipation Proclamation is not what legally freed enslaved Africans. Okay, so if you ever play Jeopardy or something like that and they ask you that question, it's not the Emancipation Proclamation. Unfortunately, many of our people think it is, but that's, a, that's another trick they played on us, okay? All right, so um, how many people know the history of African American History Month? Because we celebrate it every year, but most of us don't know the history of it, okay? I said, how many people know the history of African American History Month, what used to be called Black History Month? How many, how many people know the history of it? It started as a week. Right, started as a week, 1926. So Dr. Carter G. Woodson was uh, born uh, uh, in uh, 1875, uh, December 19th, 1875, in New Canton, Virginia. So when they talk about Virginia, Gabriel Prosser, in 1800, the Gabriel Prosser Rebellion, and then they talk about the Nat Turner Rebellion, it starts uh, August 21st, 1831, right? That's in Virginia also. And right now in Virginia, you got the blackface governor, right? <laughs> in Virginia as well. There's a whole history. There's a whole history of this in Virginia. When you had a Nat Turner Rebellion, when you studied the Nat Turner Rebellion, that rebellion almost ended slavery in the state of Virginia. Because uh, when it happened, they were so scared, they didn't know how many people Nat Turner had involved in the rebellion, because they remember back to Gabriel Prosser in 1800. And Nat Turner was in hiding for about 60 days, okay? So he was executed November 11th, uh, 1831. It wasn't until he was captured, you know, that there was some type of sigh of relief. But the state legislature in Virginia, they voted whether or not to end slavery after the rebellion, because they were scared to death. And it, it passed narrowly to uh, keep slavery intact. But one thing they did outlaw in Virginia, they made it illegal for slaves to learn and read and write, because Nat Turner was literate. Up until 1831, in that Nat Turner rebellion, it was legal for slaves to learn and read and write in Virginia. Most states, it was illegal. Virginia was the exception. But because of Nat Turner, and he could read the Bible, and he used the Bible as a weapon to teach his people that they were supposed to be free, okay? He could, he could read the Bible, and he was also preaching to white people as well. 
which is kind of interesting uh, on some level, disturbing on others. But, um, <laughs> but what happened was <laughs> they, they made it illegal for slaves to learn and read and write after the Nat Turner Rebellion. Okay, so there's a rich history when we deal with Virginia, and we know it's one of those Confederate states. But when we study Dr. Carter G. Woodson, um, he was born in 1875, 10 years after slavery ends. He's born to former slaves. He, doesn't, he doesn't, doesn't go to formal schooling until about age 20, okay? And uh, his mother teaches him uh, basically how to read and write. But uh, he's going to become an educator. He becomes the second uh, African-American to get a Ph.D. from Harvard. He gets a Ph.D. from Harvard in 1912 in American history, okay? The first, who was the first uh, African-American to get a Ph.D. from Harvard? Right, right, that was in 1895. But, but he was born to free parents, where Dr. Carter G. Woodson was born to uh, uh, former slaves. So he, because he's an educator, he teaches at Howard University. Uh, he teaches at some other colleges also. He realizes that our people do not know their history, not just the children, but the parents also, okay? So uh, 1915, as, 1915, as I said, was the 50th anniversary of the Civil War ending in the 13th, in the 13th Amendment. So there was a symposium, a three-week symposium in Chicago uh, that documented and chronicled and had all types of exhibits, things like this, to uh, celebrate and commemorate what had happened to African Americans in those 50 years. What had we accomplished in those 50 years? So it was at the symposium he gets the idea to create an organization to document, preserve, research the history and accomplishments of African Americans. Not just in this country, but also on the continent of Africa as well, because the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History dealt with African history also. So he co-founds it with uh, some, other, some other members, uh, September 9th, 1915. And in 1916, he's going to create the Journal of Negro History because at this time we know you have rapid segregation and uh, a lot of the white historical journals did not want to publish our papers of our stories because they didn't want to deal, we wanted to deal with different topics they, they wanted to deal with. So he creates this Journal of Negro History so we can publish our own journals, our own historical papers. He also creates a, a similar type journal for black teachers to use in schools also, okay? Uh, 1921, he creates the Associated Publishers, Inc., okay? And this is a publishing company for us to publish our own textbooks. He publishes his textbook, he publishes his books, I should say, and is, is they publish textbooks for uh, colleges like HBCUs and uh, high schools also. So, uh, now, 19, now going into the 1920s, going this period of time, this is like a really, really important period of time because you come out of World War I, which is 1914, 1918. This is the beginning of the uh, Great Migration. And the Great Migration is basically 1915 and 1970. You have uh, six million African Americans migrating from the South, going up North, going out West, uh, things like this. And they're running from white domestic terrorism in the South. Some of us being ran off of our land. We're being lured up North to go work in factories. So during World War I, you have about five million men that go fighting World War I. About 370,000 of them are African Americans. And this creates a labor vacuum in the factories up north, right? So we're going up north looking for better opportunities. We're looking for uh, equal protection of, under the law. We're looking for better wages. Uh, many of us are trying to get, some of us are sharecroppers and we're trying to get, get out of those fields. Some of us are farmers and we're being ran off of our farms. We're being shot and killed. Our farms are being taken away from us. Through, through, through different means, legal loopholes in the law, like heirs property, okay, if you got any property down in Georgia or Alabama or something like that, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, so you got a lot of them migrating up north, okay? And as they go up north, right, you're going to have a rise in uh, riots and rebellions and things like that that take place up north also, okay? So you have the Harlem Renaissance that starts in the mid-1910s, goes into the mid-1930s. You got the Marcus Garvey movement, which is the largest mass movement of African people in the history of this country. He has somewhere between 4 million to 6 million members of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which started in 1914 in Jamaica, because he's an immigrant, came from Jamaica, okay? And he comes to the U.S. in 1916. He's inspired by Booker T. Washington. That's one of his inspirations. He read up from slavery, Booker T. Washington. Washington dies in 1915. He comes in uh, 1960. He wants to hook up with Booker T. Washington, but finds out he passed away. He's going to set up chapters here, okay, in the, in, in the U.S. also. Uh, you have the Harlem Renaissance going on. And then when World War I ends, you have what's called the New Negro. And the New Negro 
these, these, they, they, it was a, a new consciousness of African Americans because you had 370,000 African American men who served in World War I. And when they came back to this country, they said, we're not taking this segregation and all this stuff that we, that we dealt with before we left. We said, we fought for this country, we died for this country. They said, there are going to be some changes. They said, we want all of our rights right now, okay? Um, and then 1919, the year after World War I ends, it's called the Red Summer. And the Red Summer, you had over 25 major race riots in this country that broke out. And James Weldon Johnson, who wrote the Black National Anthem, because we knew the White National Anthem was not for us. We, we, we knew it wasn't for us, wasn't by us, wasn't about us. So he wrote the Black National Anthem. But he called it the Red Summer because the streets of America were flowing with blood. What okay? Year that? What year was that? The Red Summer? Yes, sir. 1919. That's right after World War I ends. World War I ends in 1918. And then the next year is called the Red Summer. You got race rides in Chicago, Atlanta. You have them all across the country, over 25 major race rides. Um, and if you go back to 1917, that's when, during World War I, that's when you had the East St. Louis race ride, mm -hmm. which leads to the uh, silent march of somewhere about 10,000, 11,000 African Americans uh, in Manhattan marching, uh, marching for an anti lynching law. Okay, that's 1917. Okay, and you can have a lot of African American activists involved in that. Uh, you go back to 1909, that's when the uh, NAACP is formed. One of the main reasons why the NAACP is formed is to fight against the lynchings that are taking place, because this is white domestic terrorism, right? And we're fighting for anti lynching laws. The NAACP comes out of an organization called the Niagara Movement of 1905. That's Dr. W. B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells, things like this. They talked about uh, Niagara, Niagara Falls in Canada. The Niagara Movement comes out of another organization that was founded in 1898 called the Afro-American Council. Okay, it was called Afro-American because the term Afro-American didn't start in the 1960s with Malcolm X, that goes back to the 1830s. Okay, the term African-American didn't start in 1988 or 89 with Jesse Jackson. The first recorded usage of the term African-American goes back to May 15, 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Washington Post has two articles that deal with the history of the term African-American. So, uh, the Afro-American Council was founded by T. Thomas Fortune and Bishop Alexander Walters. And this was one of the early civil rights organizations, okay? And in, by, by 1903, there's a split that takes place. There's a pro-Booker T. Washington faction, okay? There's a pro-Booker T. Washington faction. And then there's a faction with Dr. W.B. Dr. W. B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells, which is more progressive. They're going to split away and form the Niagara Movement in 1905, and then they basically get co-opted in 1909, if you understand the history of it. I'm not beating up on anybody in the NAACP, but study the history of it, okay? It's precipitated by the Springfield, Illinois race ride of 1908. And this causes, it, this causes the African Americans to think that maybe we need a different approach to these organizations. Maybe we need an interracial organization, okay? Because this is one of the early race rides up north. We're used to them in the south, but this is one of the early ones up north, right? So of the 57, approximately 57 founders of the NAACP, seven were African Americans. Okay? Uh, Dr. W. Dr. W. B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells. William Monroe Trotter was with them. How many people are familiar with William Monroe Trotter? William Monroe Trotter was with them. That was a bad brother himself. But he didn't join the NAACP because he was leery of the white money flowing into it. He helped organize it, but he didn't join it. Okay? And then also, William Monroe Trotter was a, a, a bit of a sexist because he didn't think women belonged in the organization. So he and Ida B. Wells always butted heads. Okay? So, you have, all this, you have all this taking place. So uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson creates Negro History Week the second uh, week in February. Now, he ain't choose February because it's the coldest month of the year. He ain't choose February because it's the shortest month of the year. Okay? Who, who knows why he chose the month of February and the second week in February? Who knows why? Because, yeah, go, go ahead. I don't want to. No. <laughs> because it was Lincoln's and I, uh, and, um, Oh, excuse me, my son knows. Yeah. Frederick Douglass' birthday. Right, so, so <laughs> the second week of February contains the birth date of Abraham Lincoln, April, April 12th, I mean February 12th, and uh, Frederick Douglass. His assumed birth date was February 14th, because Douglass didn't know that his exact birth date, and he didn't know the exact year he was born. It's either 1817, 1818, okay, when you study uh, Douglass. And Douglass wrote three autobiographies. His first one comes out, uh, I think it's about 1845, his first autobiography comes out. So there were already celebrations that African Americans had during this second week in February because of these two birthdays.
Okay, so Dr. Carnegie Whitson uh, inserted his new uh, cultural celebration into that period of time. Now, it was never supposed to be the only time of the year we study our history. That's, unfortunately, a lot of us have it backwards. Um, he felt that our history needed to be studied year round. He felt for school children, he felt that this was a, a, a week that school children showed what they had been learning and studying year round. He said it didn't make sense to just study our history one month out of uh, one week out of 52 weeks of the year. He said that didn't make sense. He also thought he also felt that um, bigotry and prejudice and racism, things like this, largely comes from people not understanding our history, buying into stereotypes, things like this. So you saw actually when you look at the book, I can't, I don't remember if they showed it in this segment, but when you look in, in the book, they show um, from uh, uh, from Dr. Gates, they show the. Uh, different images of blackface and the caricatures, right? And this is coming when you study the history of the menstrual, sh menstrual shows. That was designed to lampoon and make fun of African Americans, uh, especially enslaved Africans, and to show them as being dim-witted and childlike. And that goes back to about 1820 or 1829 with a man named uh, T.D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, who's known as the father of the menstrual shows. And according to the legend, he sees a, 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 a slave boy, teenage boy, something like this, attending, attending to animals. And um, he's singing a song, turn around, jump around, I jump just so. Every time I turn around, I jump Jim Crow. So he puts on, um, I guess, black shoe polish, look like Michael Jackson. Uh, <laughs> he puts on blackface. He puts on tattered, torn clothing. He adopts a southern dialect to imitate enslaved Africans. And he does his Jim Crow character on stage, right? Because he's a performer. So white people love it, okay? And then you start having all these other white men that do the same thing, imitate this. He, so Thomas D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, he's known as the father of the minstrel shows, okay? This is how the minstrel shows start, 1828, 1829. And the South is also arguing, as um, Gates talked about in the documentary, the South is also arguing that the quote-unquote peculiar institution is beneficial to everybody. They, they, they're arguing that the slaves are too dim with it and too childlike to take care of themselves, okay? And if you let them go, you're going to have, you're going to have total chaos that's going to take place. So we're going to take care of them. We're going to provide them room and board. They're going to become almost part of the family. And when you, when you watch the movie The Birth of a Nation, this is what it depicts, okay? It takes place. To, how many people have seen the movie The Birth of a Nation, the original one? It's three hours. It's, it's a silent movie. With captions, so you so be ready to be bored, okay? <laughs> but but some important things. Number one, it takes place during slavery, the Civil War and Reconstruction. It takes place in Piedmont, South Carolina. South Carolina is the state where the Civil War started, okay? April 12, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter. And it all the negative stereotypical Images of African Americans are depicted in the movie. The, the coons and the, 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 the pickaninnies and the mammies, all that stuff is depicted in the movie. And most of the uh, characters that were African American were white people in blackface. And the movie yeah. showed uh, black men trying to rape white women also in the movie. So this movie calls race rides in the streets of America. Okay? Uh, it was also shown at the White House for. Uh, uh, I was about to say Donald Trump, but it was shown the White House of Woodrow Wilson. Okay, it was shown the White House of Woodrow Wilson as well. It's directed by D.W. Griffith. So D.W. Griffith, um, he goes on to team up with Charlie Chaplin and uh, Douglas Fairbanks and a, a, a female actress, and they form United Artist Studios. This is after he does his movie. He makes about 400 short movies. D.W. Griffith. He revolutionizes this movie. The Birth of a Nation revolutionizes movie making. Okay, but but the movie was distributed by a man named Louis B. Mayer. Now Louis B. Mayer took the profits he made from that movie, and he teamed up with two other men named Metro and Goldwyn, and they formed Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios, better known as MGM Studios. So you gotta you gotta study the history of all this stuff. Okay, you got say that again. I mean, what, I mean you can read it yourself. You, uh, proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe a word that I say. Say again? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it did, yeah, because it was it was revolutionary at its time. Yeah. It was uh, the longest movie at its time, three hours, it was the most expensive, cost a hundred thousand dollars to make it. So he was a celebrated movie maker. This guy, D.W. Griffin, he made about four hundred movie shorts. Okay? 
So, but this movie is going to rejuvenate the Ku Klux Klan because the Klan is depicted in the movie as saving the nation. Okay, they at the end of the movie they put down a rebellion of former uh, Union Negro soldiers, and it says it says this is the birth of a nation. Right? The movie is based upon a novel called The Klansman, written by a man named Thomas Dixon. The the novel was turned into a play. When the play was playing in Philadelphia in 1906, you had 3,000 African Americans who rallied and protested the play because we knew it was detrimental to our existence. When the, uh, when the movie The Birth of a Nation comes out in 1915, the NAACP <clears throat> leads protests against the movie because we knew it was detrimental to our existence. And, and William Monroe Trotter, when it comes to Boston, he leads protests. There was a, a, on PBS about two years ago, Independent Lands, they had a documentary called the birth of a movement. The birth of a movement. And it's about William Monroe Trotter protesting against the movie The Birth of a Nation. Okay? Now, what's interesting, today, the national, not the local, but the national NAACP gets image awards for the TV show Empire, which to me is like the movie The Birth of a Nation, if you understand stereotypical images. If you understand stereotypical images, and I've been studying media for 27 years. They, they, they used to lead protests against that. Today they're giving image awards for some of the same stereotypical images. I don't understand it. I don't understand it, all right? Uh, all right, so I'm going to wrap up here in a couple minutes. Um, so, so 1926, you have Negro History Week that starts. And um, 1976 becomes Black History Month. And uh, President Gerald Ford gives, a, gives an address to recognize Black History Month, recognize something we've been doing for 50 years. Imagine that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, each year, the president gives an address to recognize uh, Black History Month. And then a few years ago, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History um, uh, changed it to African American History Month. Okay, so, this, so there's a theme each year. And if you go to asala.org, A-S-A-L-H.org, asala.org, um, you can research African American History Month. They have tools for you, resources if you are a teacher. We don't have to recycle the same 15 to 20 black people each year, okay? Because our children are tired of that, okay? <laughs> There's a theme each year, and this year's theme is black migrations. So we know August 20th, 16, 19, is uh, the anniversary of the Dutch warship of 20 some odd Negroes coming into Jamestown, Virginia. Now, even though that did happen, and if you listen to my show, you watch some of my uh, presentations, I'm doing a lecture tomorrow at Andy's Knowledge Cafe, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. in Highland Park, Michigan. If you um, study Dr. David M. Hotel, no relation to me, uh, he has a groundbreaking book called The First Americans Where Africans Documented Evidence. And his book documents um, the African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, you also have the Folsom people. How many people are familiar with Dr. Claude Anderson? Okay, so Dr. Claude Anderson is one of my teachers. I just interviewed him January 13th on my radio show. Uh, he talks about the Folsom people, F-O-L-S-O-M. The Folsom people come from West Africa uh, about 13,000, 14,000 years ago. They're in this land. Folsom Prison, Folsom Prison is, is named after them. Folsom, Arizona is named after them as well. So, even though Jamestown, Virginia, this happened, we were here for tens of thousands of years before that. And even if you study the Spanish, because the Spanish were involved in the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, before the English get involved, okay? When you look at Spain and Portugal, they're right next to each other. Portuguese get involved about 1440, 1441. Spain is right behind them. But you got to understand the, the, the history of the Africans known as the Moors, who go on to the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, in 711 AD. And they're going through, uh, mainly through Morocco. Spain and Portugal is right above Morocco. And you have millions of them going in over, over time. Okay, you have waves of them going in. Going in. And then, they're not just in Spain and, and Portugal. They go into France. They go into Sicily. They go into Crete. They go into Czechoslovakia. They go into Austria and Germany. Okay, this is how you get names like Schwarzenegger. Because Schwartz means dark or swarthy. And Nager is Austrian and German for ne Austrian and German for Negro. So when you have like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's from Austria, in the bodybuilding world, he was known as the Austrian Oak. Okay, the the the, the Moors they influence everything dealing with European culture: their art, their language, their names, their foods, 
Uh, they introduced the periodic tables called alchemy. Today we call it chemistry. Okay, they introduced all this in, into Europe. And they basically saved Europe, bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. Cotton was introduced by the Moors in Europe. They introduced cotton and sugar in the 9th and 10th century. All that stuff came to kick us in the behind. Because before cotton was king, sugar was king. Because they introduced sugar and a lot of Europeans got hooked on sugar. So when Columbus is setting sail on his four voyages, starting August 3rd, 1492, on the Nina Independence and the Santa Maria, he's searching for another source of sugar also. So this is why when he goes into Jamaica in 1494, when he goes into the Bahamas in 1492, when he goes into Cuba, he goes into Hispaniola, which we call uh, Haiti, okay, Santo Domingo, which we call the Dominican Republic, they're setting up these huge sugar cane plantations. This is why. And even today, one of the largest exports out of Cuba is sugar, right? So all this history is, you, we have to understand how um, historical events don't happen in the back. They are the results of a sequence of historical events that lead up to larger events taking place, okay? So I'm going to, uh, so this year's theme is black migrations, uh, especially dealing with the great migration of uh, 1915 uh, to 1970. And that, that totally changes this country also, uh, the, the great migration as well. So I'm going to wrap it up with that. I'll take any questions. Uh, did everybody get, and I'll take questions just a second, did everybody get the pamphlet that came around? It's one pamphlet, a white pamphlet. And it's a black flyer. It's a black and white flyer. So I'm doing a lecture tomorrow at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, 71 Oakman Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. We know the film Black Panther's up for seven Oscars. We know it won big at the Screen Actors Guild Awards. They were showing it for free in select AMC theaters across the country February 1st to February 7th. And this presentation uh, is called Wakanda Forever, How Black Panther Reconnects African Americans to African History and Culture. So I deal with how the film relates to African history, culture, language, uh, languages, things like that. Okay, Just that's for the women, Michael, mm -hmm. tell them about the warriors in um, who they really are. The well, 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 so, the, so in the film, how many people saw the film Black Panther? Okay, so um, you have the uh, Dora Malaji. The Dora Malaji, Dora Malaji means adored ones. And the Dora Malaji are the bodyguards of the king of Wakanda and the, and the royal family. Okay, so you saw them with the bald heads. And the, and the rings around their neck. They're patterned after the, um, what are known as the uh, Amazons or the Dahomean warriors, okay? They were called the Ahosi or the Mino, who, who were our wives or the, or the king's wives. And these were fierce female warriors also in Dahomey, which is modern day Benin, okay? Uh, so you see them in like the 19th century. But that's who they're patterned after. These are real female warriors. The, so, um, the, 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 the film is deep because there are 11 different African cultures that are represented in the film. Ruth Carter, who's the costume designer, who was also the costume designer for the uh, movie Malcolm X. She's up for an Oscar, by the way. Uh, she studied 11 African cultures for six months. So we see this all represented in the film. When, we, when you see the beginning of the film and they have a ritual combat that takes place, right, between T'Challa and M'Baku of the Jabari tribe. That waterfall is called Warrior's Fall. That's where the traditional combat takes place. On the side of the mountain, you see all these people standing, and they have different types of dress on. Because Wakanda is not one group of people. It's made up of 18 different tribes, Wakanda. Um, and so that's represented. You, that's why you see different dress, because you have different tribes, okay? But the film is deep. We saw uh, African martial arts display. We saw ground fighting. We know the first fighting systems known to man come out of Africa. We saw ground fighting, we saw grappling. The language that's spoken is a real African language, it's Isikosa. Isikosa is spoken in Southern Africa. Nelson Mandela spoke Isikosa, okay? And it's, it's part of a larger uh, group of about 500 African languages called Bantu, Bantu languages. When we, we just celebrated Kwanzaa in December, December 26th through January 1st. Kwanzaa is Kiswahili. Kiswahili is a Bantu language also. Okay, so all this history is interrelated and interconnected. And even though Wakanda is a fictitious place, Wakanda is a real word also. Wakanda is not a made-up word. We see Wakanda in Native American languages, like the Omaha Ponca language and the Sioux Indian language. It's also a Bantu word as well. So this movie is deep on multiple levels. So that's what I'll, I'll be breaking down tomorrow. But I saw some hands for questions, so we'll get to questions in there. And then I have my DVD lectures over here also. That helps support the African History Network, helps us stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay the bills, etc. Take care of my daughter. Let's say, let's go. Yes. I appreciated this second um, presentation a, a little more 
uh, just because he showed more of our effort to free ourselves. Okay, you're talking about part two? Part two. Right. Because we don't, we don't see, I, you know, I don't see enough of that in history. Well, there's a reason to, why. To, right, I know. And, and, and I want to see and know more because I think we did the most, didn't right. we? To oh. free ourselves. Well, yeah, and there were various ways that we rebelled. Yeah, yeah right. it, it wasn't just it wasn't just physical slave rebellions. It was learning to read, learning to write, poisoning the white people's food, mm -hmm. slowing down the pace of work on the plantation, okay. Okay. running away. Because one of the things, one of the reasons why they didn't want us to learn to read and write is because many of us, when we learned to read and write, we wrote our own freedom papers and ran away. Mm -hmm. Because most, because the slave patrollers, see, you got to understand, during slavery, most white people were illiterate. So if you ran into slave patrollers, you can give them any piece of paper and tell them these your freedom papers. Most of them couldn't read. So a lot of us, when we learned to read and write, we wrote our own freedom papers and ran away. So there were various ways that we rebelled. Right. Right. And a lot of times with rebellions, you had slave, you had the slaves in the house. They were the ones in closest proximity to the white people. They were poisoning their food. Yeah. You know, uh, grinding up uh, uh, glass in their food. Poison them, and then we saw this really big in the Haitian Revolution. I'll come to your I'll come to question in just a second. The Haitian Revolution in Haiti. See, one thing Gates didn't talk about is Nat Turner's mother was from Haiti, mm -hmm. and her and her slave master fled Haiti during the Haitian Revolution. So when you when you really study the history of Nat Turner, his mother taught him to hate slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's different. It's different than the way it's depicted in the movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then when the when we have uh, the cotton gin, 1793, Eli Whitney, okay, this is going to revolutionize uh, cotton and make it more efficient to grow cotton. But, the, but three years, uh, ten years later, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 is going to be detrimental for Africans in this country. Why? Because the Haitians beat uh, Napoleon Bonaparte so badly, and they didn't just defeat the French, they defeated the Spanish and the British who were allies. But it caused, it almost bankrupted France. So France sold all the land they had in this land, 828,000 square miles of land, they sold to the U.S. for less than three cents an acre. It's about $15 million. It's called the, Haitian, it's called the uh, Louisiana Purchase of 1803. It was, it was signed by Thomas Jefferson. Okay? But what this did was this doubled the territory of the U.S. and gave them more land to, to plant crops and, the, and increase the need for slavery. Okay? This is, this is what the Louisiana Purchase did here. Now, most of the land that... France sold the U.S. France didn't even own. It was stolen from Native Americans and Africans who were here. If you if the, uh, go to history.com, history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, they have a they have an article there, the Louisiana Purchase, and read it. They tell you that most of the land that France sold the U.S. was stolen. Mm -hmm. I saw another. I saw a hand. Yes. Sir. I really have three questions, but mm -hmm. I, will, I will keep it short. My third person stand on the first one note about. Uh, Black Panther with a Nigerian. I watched it for the first time. I mm -hmm. watched it. My, I watched it three times for the first time with a Nigerian mm -hmm. who had refused to watch it because mm -hmm. of she had very negative. Heard other Nigerians felt it was so false mm -hmm. that she didn't watch it. What, what did she think after she saw it? After she saw it, she had a whole other. Oh take yeah, on it. people in the continent of Africa loved it. Yeah, she had a whole other take on it. People after in Brazil loved, loved it. it. Yeah, but but and basically it's half the things she was saying mm -hmm. because it combined and she knew the. Uh, was it Bantu? She, she, Bantu? Bantu, she, yeah. she, she recognized that. But before that, mm -hmm. she was she, she hated it because she said there's no such place as, as, uh, as Wakanda. Up, you know, she right. heard all this stuff. She was saying, it's all this made up stuff. She didn't want to see it. But once she saw it, she right. see it. Some of us are stubborn like that. that. Was right. 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 That's pretty cool. Right. But, okay, back yeah. to other two Go questions ahead. that wasn't that. Go ahead. Uh, Margaret Gonis, I saw the opera Margaret Gonis. I never mm -hmm. read the book. Okay. And in the opera, she did kill her children. Mm -hmm. But in the very end, she also killed herself. Right. Now, did she really actually kill herself? No, I don't think she, no, because uh, as Gates lays out, um, okay. she was taken back. Yeah, she was taken she, back. She, she was taken yeah, back, yeah, she was in taken slavery. Back. Right. And she had one child left. Mm -hmm. She killed that child. And in the opera, the, play, the slave meant when she went back to the slave master, the slave master loved her, supposedly. Okay. She had children by the slave. Two of her children was by her natural father, her mm -hmm. husband, and two of her children was by the slave master. Okay. Okay. And she killed, and that's why the slave master wanted her back. Right. Because he loved her and he loved his children. Okay. And so when she came back to him, 
she killed her last final child, which was his child. Okay. And she killed herself in the opera. Okay. Which yeah. Made, um, which made with that, I don't which remember. Which with made uh, an absolutely fabulous opera. With that portion. Because all operas are sad. Yeah, with that with that portion of it, I've never seen the opera, so I, I don't okay. remember. I'm not All sure right, about so that. I just wondered if that was true mm -hmm. in the opera she actually killed herself. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the migration thing, you, meant, you talked about WW1, mm -hmm. but I thought, but maybe you know, mm -hmm. that WW2 was when the black soldiers came back and was really a you know. That happened too, also. Yeah. World War One, it happens. That's when you have the new Negro. Yeah, I and then we would call race man. It happens in World War One. It's going to happen again in World War Two. Because when we came back from World War I, segregation wasn't ended, right? right? So we're going to come back with the same thing. And see, what's going to happen is after World War II, then you're going to start going into the deindustrialization of the inner city. Right. Because as more African Americans are moving up north yeah. into these, into these um, white areas, and we're directed into certain Detroit, areas, Chicago, Detroit, Chicago, yeah, Chicago right. things like this, right. you're going to have more race riots that take place up north. You had one 1943 in Detroit during World War II, a huge race riot that broke out, right? So after World War II ends, uh, 1945, 19, basically 1945, 1946, beginning of the baby boomer generation, these white men come back, they start having children, right? Now they need larger homes. They start building the suburbs, they start building the suburbs. 1947, you had the Federal uh, Housing Act which allowed uh, uh, white men to put 3% down on low interest loans and get houses built out in the suburbs, right? When we try to take advantage of that, okay, we're redlined because the redlining system was created in 1933 by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which came, which was signed into law by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which is part of the New Deal. The Homeowners Loan Corporation and then the Federal Housing Administration in 1934. All these things are going to be used to discriminate against us. Okay, so when we try to buy property in the in what we call the inner city, mm -hmm. trying to get take advantage of those loans, which is a redistribution of our tax dollars, we're discriminated against. We told those are high risk areas. So then you have white people moving out to the suburb. You have the, uh, the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts in 1952 and 1956 that drove drive 41,000 miles of U.S. Interstate Highway all across the country. They run through our communities like I-375, ran through Black Bottom, Paradise Valley. This happens all across the country, wrapping right? out a lot of our businesses and homes. So when you have the, uh, the uh, Detroit Rebellion takes place in 1967 on 12th and Claremont, a lot of those people who, a lot of those African Americans who lived in 12th and Claremont, a lot of them were displaced from Black Bottom. So they were already mad. Okay? So, and, and what's taking place is the, the white people are moving out to the suburbs, but the factories are being moved out to the suburbs also. Okay? And they're, they're driving, they're going from downtown, the downtown of the inner city, out to the homes and the factories, okay? And we're being left in the inner city. So by the time we start taking over these, and I'll come to questions in just a second. By the time African-American mayors start, uh, uh, African-Americans start becoming mayors, those cities that we took control of, they were on life support. They had the, the decline in tax bases. Okay, there was white flight taking place, all that stuff, right? This, this is what happened. This is what happened in Detroit. The white people were already fleeing Detroit before Mayor Young became mayor in 1974. That they, they were fleeing Detroit before the rebellion in 1967. Okay, I saw saw a hand. Okay, yes. I'm going to make it short because our pastor has a long drive home. Oh, okay. But, but we, we've had a, a lot of history on us as a people, mm -hmm. and I've learned a lot. I wish you would tell us a little bit about yourself, mm -hmm. an introduction of your studies and any titles that you might hold, just to, so we know who you are. Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to talk to the whole street. Say it again. Okay, that's good. But I want I want you to start back to when this all became interesting to you. Seventh grade, tenth grade, college. Uh, well, I started. I've been studying twenty seven years. I started in college. Uh, I graduated from Wayne State University with a bachelor's degree in business administration. I started studying history, uh, really about nineteen ninety two. Um, I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. I'm in seven documentaries. Uh, host of the African History Network show. Uh, March 10th will be my ninth year doing radio. I'm on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, um, I write articles. 
I print about, I think, 60 articles. You can read all my articles at my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, I have uh, about 40 of my lectures on DVD. And uh, going back to when I was in, uh, now, when I was, in, when I was in high school, I didn't like history because they were teaching us basically white history. They would teach us, they would teach us like Dr. King and all that stuff like in February. Mm -hmm. But I really didn't like, I really didn't like history. Um, what did it for me, conscious hip-hop in the late 80s and early 90s, the autobiography of Malcolm X I read in 1992 when the movie Malcolm X came out, and I was listening to And in conscious hip-hop, we had snippets of Minister Farrakhan and Malcolm X and all this stuff in conscious hip-hop. And some of the people I was hanging around at Wayne State uh, helped propel me in that direction. The TV show A Different World was, was really big as well, because we got to see a lot of this on the TV show A Different World. But uh, yeah, I started studying it. I started studying in college, and I saw a relationship between the history and culture and economic empowerment because I was studying business administration and studying entrepreneurship, uh, also. So that's uh, that's that's how I got started. Uh, I saw another hand. Okay, I want to make sure I go around the room. I, know, I don't know if you really okay. answered Ms. Springer's question, but quickly before you do, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you, go ahead. you know, we're at a crossroad with our youth today, mm -hmm. and uh, early today at lunch, I had one of my students that uh, uttered the N-word, Sure. and I asked him, I said, uh, who, who are you talking about? And he right. said, black people. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean, black people? Mm -hmm. So I had him to look it up right. and, uh, uh, you know, write down some paragraphs on it and kind of give me his take on what he had read. Mm -hmm. And he was, pre he was pretty miffed about it. He couldn't really explain it. But, he, you know, he said that uh, this is what I've always heard. Right. It's us. Well, well it, it, that's because, um, largely because negative corporate control hip-hop is used to destroy the minds of our youth. If you want to destroy a nation, you do it through the music because the music hits the youth first. Yeah. So, and, and how do we get them more engaged into their history, because mm -hmm. as we look today, education is free. You probably mm -hmm. look at another 20, 30, maybe 50 years. Education will cost. Mm -hmm. They say it's free, mm -hmm. but it will cost. You talking about K through 12? K through 12. Okay. It will cost you mm -hmm. a monetary uh, uh, stipend eventually right. because right. we don't take advantage of it. Right. Uh, you know, we go in our schools and it becomes a social hour. Mm -hmm. It becomes a social edifice. As to being uh, serious about getting your education, right. we see some of our foreigners that can come here, mm -hmm. and they can take advantage of our education, the free education. They go back home, right. and they uh, uh, prevail their culture mm -hmm. into what they've learned here. How do we get our youth? So, so, so let me give you some things. Number one, children like to film Black Panther. Okay, I've done a presentation for uh, about sixty fifth through twelfth graders okay. dealing with the film Black Panther and I show them how the film relates to our history and I use the film to teach our history to them. Mm -hmm. um, we have to meet them where they are. A lot of them uh, like sports figures. I, I haven't met one child that didn't like Muhammad Ali. They all know Muhammad Ali. You can teach history just with Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali connects you to Malcolm X. He connects you to Dr. King because Dr. King and Muhammad Ali had a secret friendship that a lot of people don't know about. March 30th, 1967, they did a press conference together, Dr. King and Malcolm X. This is four days before Dr. King officially comes out against the Vietnam War, April 4th, 1967. He delivers his speech beyond Vietnam. April 28th, 1967, Muhammad Ali refuses to be drafted to the Vietnam War. And when you go on YouTube and you watch this, and they talk about how uh, they, 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 they had a meeting. The, the guy who's interviewing him, he said, well, we're not going to talk exactly what, we're not going to tell you exactly what we were talking about, but, you know, we were talking about the Vietnam War and our opposition, and uh, Malcolm, I mean, uh, Muhammad Ali is with the Nation of Islam, Dr. King's a Baptist minister, and, and, and Malcolm said, even though, you know, I'm a Muslim, he's a Christian, he said, we're still brothers. He said, we still come together at the end of the day, okay? So we can use those different figures to teach our history to our children. Okay, uh, so you got Muhammad Ali, even with LeBron James. Oh, no, a good one is Colin Kaepernick. Because most of the kids know Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick connects you to the national anthem. You can deal with the history of the national anthem. You can deal with why Kaepernick took a knee. Why did he sacrifice uh, millions of dollars just like Muhammad Ali sacrificed millions of dollars? And, and they stripped him of his title. Muhammad Ali said that they took away my title. He said they did what no man in the ring could do because he was undefeated. Okay, so we, we have to meet them where they are. And the other thing is, is that when we look at hip hop, all, all hip hop is not bad. A lot, now a lot of this, a lot of the corporate control hip hop is garbage. But 
Go to azlyrics.com, the letter A, the letter Z, lyrics.com. You can type in the name of any song, and they'll give you the lyrics. We need to go over these lyrics with our children to understand the programming that's being fed to them. They're being taught to hate themselves through the music because these same record companies have white artists, and they don't put out negative music for them. Okay, so we have to have these conversations with them. We need to, we need to look at the lyrics from Cardi B. Okay, I know she thinks, says some things every now and then that have make halfway sense politically when you take out all the curse words and the profanity and the vulgarity. <laughs> I understand that, but if you look, you read her lyrics, this is programming, talk teaching about money, uh, sex, materialism, red bottoms, all that stuff. It's, it's destructive and negative. But she she became famous on a ratchet. Reality TV show called uh, Love and Hip Hop, which is which is like the birth of a nation of today. It's, it's something on a whole nother level. So we, we have to teach this to our children and understand the game that's being played on them. I saw a hand. Yeah, go ahead. You, you almost touched on the history, some inkster history, mm -hmm. when you talked about the plants being moved to the suburbs mm -hmm. and. This little town here uh, was one of the few places that men, families who came from the south to Detroit, got jobs in the plant, wanted to move to the suburbs, mm -hmm. but couldn't to Dearborn and Lebanon all around, but they could come to Inkster. Inkster, right. And it's it's a city you might want to do some research. Well, that's a rich history, and Malcolm lived here for a period of time this also. Is, yeah. This is supposed When he was paroled to, in 1952. This little, there is supposed to be, supposed to be more historical people come out of this little city as well I've been told than any other city in the country. And and it's not documented anywhere. Okay. Only through our elders. Through the oral yeah you gotta document that. You have to record them. You wanna document that. Right. I used to see uh, Malcolm X lunch when I worked in the drugstore. Mm -hmm. He crocheted me a hat. He crocheted you a hat. Okay. <laughs> Are you serious? What drugstore was that? Dr. Milton's drugstore in Harrison. He used to come up yeah. and he crocheted me a hat. We have to tell that on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Tell it, was, it was between like 52 to 64. Malcolm X. Malcolm X, yeah. He lived in Inkster for a while. Mm -hmm. We do black history and collections uh, on Sunday morning during, during Black History Month, and Mrs. Springer is doing one on Sunday. Hank Garrett, Hank Garrett wants to hang out on Harrison. I met our people's secret till Sunday. I saw, I saw a hand in the back. This this street just up here next over. Uh, all types of black profitable Okay, I saw a hand back there. Yes. That was the thing because I was born in 1951. Okay. And so during that period of time, up through the 60s, and I graduated in 69, I was here in Easter. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Young, the store was there, the Glover store, mm -hmm. Chinsu's, all of them. They used to hang out right Ladies, here on Harrison, car washes, everything. And everything. And yes, that's As a matter of fact, that's what we did. Right. We Sunday school. We got to <laughs> Sunday school to go over there and come back here. <laughs> There was a four-story hotel on Harrison called the Yorba, and the performers that performed in Detroit but could not stay in the hotels in Detroit would come to Easter to stay in the hotel. Now, now the Yorba are from Nigeria and West Africa. So why? And, 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 and you have the Yorba who were brought here to this land. Okay. They're taken into Cuba. They're taken into Jamaica. Okay. So why was it called the Yorba? Do you know? Okay. No, no. Just probably named so after them. We need to do a lot of research out here. Right. That would be no. That would be an excellent idea. Yeah, that could be our project. I saw. I guess. I guess the yeah, last question. I saw a hand back there. I was in, in college up at Michigan State. I did research. Did do that. And and I found out that we were we were Inkster was built on a sawmill. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. On this sawmill, and uh, a lot of our parents, my father came from the south. He's from Bessemer, Alabama. He was in that migration. A lot of those came, yeah. came down yeah. from. Because prior to the Great Migration, about ninety percent of us lived in the south. Root steel. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So we were coming up here looking for a better way of life. Exactly. Many of us being ran out of the South. And then we know Rosa Parks, after the Montgomery right. bus boycott, she was ran out of the South. Right. She, and she came to Detroit. 
and, and John Conyers gave her a job. Represented right. John Conyers. Can't live anywhere outside of Inkster. We were right. Can't live anywhere outside of Inkster, yeah. And I found out that they had said that they named it Inkster because of the ink. You get a no. white piece of no. paper. No. And I was like, no, that ain't Inkster. It was Robert Inkster. Robert Inkster, right. Robert Inkster. Robert Inkster. right. The mayor, right. I, 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 I thought somebody would bring that up. Huh? Did you announce about Saturday? Saturday? Saturday. Which yes, Saturday? Uh, the 16th, not this Saturday. Oh, the 16th. Okay, so uh, on the 16th, uh, there is a Middle Passage uh, commemoration ceremony taking place at the uh, Booker Dozier uh, Center, 2025 Middle Belt, yeah. right? Okay, I've seen the fly. Uh, <laughs> and I'm the, <laughs> I'm the keynote speaker there for that. So it's, what, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m.? Yes. Okay, so that's my third place. That's the third event I'm speaking at that day. That's the last, that's the last event. Yeah, so uh, I'll be the keynote speaker there. So you can see Crystal for more information. Wear, uh, wear white if you have it. It's a memorial to our ancestors that died in the Middle Passage. Right, died in the Middle Passage. So that's the part of the transatlantic slave trade going from Africa to the so-called New World. Uh, they're going into the Caribbean, uh, and they're coming here also, okay? Um, that's, that's the part of the, the what's known as the triangular trade, but they didn't always use the triangular trade to transport enslaved Africans. Okay, so with that, I want to say thank you for your attention. Uh, you can see me over at my, my table as well. We have a bundle pack today. You can six of my lectures for fifty dollars. We have some for five, some for ten. So come see me. We take debit cards and credit cards also. So we definitely need your support. Thank you once again.